Rashid, he's been coming for Soul Vibes Nation Reality Speaks for year, years. Um, he's, a, he's a good friend. Many of you see him on Facebook. He's always on there putting information, using Facebook for what it's supposed to be used for, not using it just to act well, yeah, I'm hungry, it's lunchtime, what should I eat, Facebook? You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? But putting out information, knowledge, and inspiration out for our people. Um, he's a scholar. He's been working with Ivan Van Sertima, um, Dr. Ben, and many of the great scholars all over the country. So why don't you give him a big round of applause for Brother Renoko Rashid. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me begin by acknowledging my elders. Is there anybody 56 years or older here tonight? I have your permission to begin? <laughs> Sister, you look good for 50, 56 old. Are you sure? My son just gave my age out. Oh, this is your son? Yeah. Oh, well, very good. Good genes. Good genes. I'm uh, very pleased to be back in uh, Baltimore, Harriet Tubman City. I'm very pleased to work with my sisters and brothers uh, in Reality Speaks. Um, it's nice to be back. I did a presentation last night in Washington, D.C., and early tomorrow morning I'll fly to Atlanta to do another program and the thing I guess is interesting about it is I'm doing three entirely different presentations so it's a bit of a challenge now I think I came up with this title because I figured I would entice brother Jabari the topic I figured would be something he could not say no to if I know brother Jabari and that means we're gonna talk about white people pretty bad tonight okay in <laughs> essence and we're going to look <clears throat> Uh, what we're calling the brutal nature of European behavior. Now, I've come a long way. I've been doing this since before a lot of you all were born. I'm 56 now. That means I've been doing this for 38 years, and I have evolved a lot. If you had asked me when I first got started with this whole thing why I was motivated to do what I do, I would say because I hate white people. That's what I would have said. And time went along, and, and I evolved, and I would say, no, that's not why I did it. I do it out of love for black people. Hatred is a cancer, and it's not a good thing to carry around. We don't want to take on the attributes of those who, hey, my brother, from Australia, <laughs> those who oppress us. Okay? In other words, we, don't, we do not want to train an entire generation of black-skinned white people, and that's the tricky part. How do you get this person's foot off your neck without becoming like him? I don't want to be like him. So what I'm going to do tonight is just use four case studies to deal with European behavior historically in very different parts of the world and then hopefully save some time at the end for a lively question and answer period. When I deal with these sisters and brothers here, I kind of feel like we're dealing with a kind of an intergenerational transmission of wisdom. It is very, very important to me now to feel like we elders, because I'm an elder myself now, I suppose, that we are mentoring the next generation, that we are taking whatever we've learned, good, bad, and ugly, and transferring it to another generation so that you all can take this to a level that we have not been able to attain. You understand what I'm saying? That we cannot be so egotistic and selfish with this knowledge that we feel like it's just about us. We have to be able to prepare those who are going to come after us, just as you will have to be able to prepare yourself to train future generations. Okay, we don't want to have to start from scratch every 25 years or so, because that way we will never get to where we want to go. Now, the four case studies I'm going to use are India, which might surprise some of you. If you know me, it won't surprise you. Number two, Australia and Tasmania. And then I'm going to use what is called the transatlantic slave trade or the maafa, although the word maafa really is, encompasses a broader historical um, arena. And I'm going to look, look at lynchings in the United States. And I'm going to use pictures. So make sure that you can see very well because the presentation is going to be almost entirely um, visual. So having said that, let's turn off the lights and let's begin our global journey. Again, please give these brothers and sisters a round of applause for the hard work that they are doing. Now, um, and if they would bring me a glass of water or something to drink or a bottle of water, I would love, I would love them even more. Because mm -hmm. I know there's not a drought in Baltimore, right? Now, <clears throat> what I like to do is, um, since I'm a historian and an anthropologist, 
But I also like to give a, a bit of a geography lesson. So let's start with that. And I don't know how good this map is, um, but we're going to use it tonight. This is Mother Africa. This is the mother continent <coughs> that gave birth to humanity itself. And that humanity, uh, well over 100,000 years ago, began to filter out of Africa and populate the rest of the world. There's only one race, and that's the human race. I don't care how bad you just like white folks. There's only one race, and that's the human race. And you could say, we are their parents. Now, these children of ours have gotten out of line, okay? But they come from our African roots. And so humanity is birthed in Africa. And then those Africans slowly begin to filter out of Africa. They leave Africa in three different ways initially. This is the first route. Here by Eritrea and Somalia, they would have crossed over out of Africa, out of the Horn of Africa, and gone into the Arabian Peninsula and followed this trek into Far Asia, into India, into Southeast Asia, and eventually some of them would have crossed over by water and gone into Australia and the islands of the Pacific. Another route would have been here out of Kemet, out of Egypt, crossing into the area called Gaza, into Arabia, moving into Central Asia, and some of them would have turned north through Turkey and gone into Europe. Others, <clears throat> later on, these are the first two routes, but later on, others would have gone out of North Africa through the country that we now call Morocco, crossed into Spain and gone into, gone into Europe that way and gotten frozen up there. Okay. Eventually, some of them would have wandered all the way up here into Siberia and crossed over into what is now Alaska and filtered all the way down to the tip of South America. But Africa is the birthplace. And that's the, the bit of a geography that we're going to use. Now, we're going to look at Africa, obviously, but we're going to spend a lot of time here in India, in this subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Tibet. Okay? And then we're going to go from there into Australia. Australia is the second smallest continent in the world, second only after Antarctica. And this area was populated at least 100,000 years ago. And this little place right here, I hope you can see it, it's very important in our study tonight, is Tasmania. Tasmania has a very deep significance for black people. We're going to talk about that. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the capture of African people in West and Central Africa and the transport against their will across the Atlantic Ocean into the Americas and then, of course, we're going to spend a little bit of time in the United States. And it's interesting in terms of this, uh, what is called the slave trade, and that we like to say accurately that slaves didn't come from Africa, but rather that African people were captured and taken out of Africa to the Americas. And what I'm finding out is that some of those Africans who went, ended up across the Atlantic Ocean came from way over here in Central Africa. Some of them came from as far away as Tunisia. I know because I've been there and done the research. Some of them came from Central Africa. So they didn't just come from the periphery, from the coastal area. They were captured deep in the interior and taken across the waters from Canada into Argentina. Now, <clears throat> this right here is an image of the person we call Krishna. We are in India now. Now, people will ask me, why, Renoko Rashidi, are you focusing on India? And for two basic reasons. One, India has more black people, Africans if you want to call them that, than any other country on earth. India has more black folk than any single country in the world. India has a black population of approximately 300 million people, meaning it's more than twice the size of Nigeria. So that's one reason we want to look at it. It has a very interesting history. But beyond that, India is also a place where we can study very early race relations. Now, I know some people will disavow the use of the, uh, the term race. And people will say that race is a social construct. Well, if you're going to use that, everything is a social construct. People will say there's no such thing as race. Race is not real. But the next time a white police officer pulls you over, tell him race is not real. I want that to be your first comment that you make. Because if race is not real, then racism is not real either. And we know that racism, or what we're calling racism, 
is all too real. Okay? Now, India has a black population that goes back at least 40, 50, 60,000 years. And these sisters, thank you, sister, y'all, these sisters lived, these sisters and brothers lived in peace and harmony until the white man came. And you will find that all over the place. All people travel. Asians have traveled, mongoloid types have traveled, black people travel, white people travel, but there are basic differences. When black people have traveled the world, they came bringing gifts. They showed how to make, how to make life easier. They brought things like calendars, like agricultural science. They showed how to move large objects in stone. They brought writing systems with them. When Europeans went wherever they have gone, and I defy you to tell me one place that is an exception to this rule, death and destruction has followed with them. They've raped, they've massacred, they've murdered, they've slaughtered, they've changed people's names, they've forced people to convert to different religions, religions that are not their own. So the movements are entirely different. And that speaks to the cultural differences of Africans and white people. I believe in Sheikh Anta Job's um, two cradle theory that says that the people who came from Africa from the southern cradle were warm people a kind people, a people who embrace foreigners, and that's a big part of our problem, that we have embraced other people without really consciously thinking about the consequences of it. Europeans just the opposite of that. There's a hatred, there's an antagonism, there's a, a hostility towards all things form, almost a hostility towards God itself. The idea that God is a malevolent being, that God is against you and that is us against them. It's a matter of might makes right, survival of the fittest. Those things come out of the white or northern cradle. The African world, just the opposite of that. And we're gonna go, we're gonna return to that theme again and again and again. So black folk in India, they had a good thing going on. They built a civilization along the banks of the Indus River, which is um, mostly in Pakistan, but extends into India. And they had a civilization that began about 4,000 years ago they had um, very sophisticated, hot and cold running water, flushing toilets, trash chutes. They had a game similar to dice. They had a game similar to chess. They invented the windmill. They domesticated cotton. They domesticated rice. Had a good thing going on, and then the white man came. And with him came death and destruction. Now, Krishna, who you see in front of you right now, who is always identified as black or dark blue or something like that, is earliest identified as a resistance leader to those European invasions of India beginning about 2000 BC or 1700 BC. So let's start with that. Uh -oh, sorry. And then we can. This is a head from that same area, from the Indus Valley. Civilizations tend to develop along the banks of rivers because rivers by their very nature facilitate transportation, irrigation, and communication. And thus civilization as we know it in a classical sense is made possible. And one of the first things that stands out about this piece is the nose is missing. Just like those in the Nile Valley. And I wish, instead of us just saying the white man did it because he hates us, I would love for somebody to do a really systematic study of that. In other words, are the missing noses found in Africa just in the Nile Valley? Or is it continent-wide? If you, wherever you find black people around the world, ancient civilizations, is that a characteristic that the nose is knocked off? But Chancellor Williams said, who wrote the book, Destruction of Black Civilization, that the African historian must be on a relentless search for truth and must not tremble with fear when that truth is contrary to what one would prefer to believe. For example, African involvement in the capture of other Africans. A lot of us will deny that. We will close our eyes and pretend that these mean, nasty white people did it all by themselves. That is not historically accurate. You cannot conquer a people unless you have collaborators within that people. Just like we have collaborators today. Just like we got an Uncle Thomas today. Just like we got a, what's this fellow's name? Um, Michael Steele. This is a guy with the, I can't stand these people. But the Republican Party. In fact, I, I hate to say it, but somebody sent me a website about two weeks ago. And it just broke my heart because it showed so many black men with white women. I was, just, I was hurt. 
A lot of my major sports stars, they got white women hanging. I, uh, I was crushed. I didn't want to watch no basketball, no football, no baseball for a long time. All these people I've been rooting for all my life, so many of them, they're white women. I don't know how I got started on that, okay? We were talking about collaborators. Now, this is a sister from that same civilization, too, the Indus Valley Civilization. And you, could, you would know this was a sister even if she was painted white. Because the attitude, the posture, everything speaks black woman, Baltimore 2010, okay? It's like it's timeless. These are all images from ancient India. So not only are we going to talk about race relations or ethnic relations, if you prefer that word, but I also want to just show you images of our people in these parts of the world because most of us are not used to seeing sisters and brothers in these various parts of the world. This, these um, images right here are from the religion called um, or the people called the Jains, J-A-I-N-S. And this is a precursor of um, Buddhism. Now, Buddhism and the Jains developed as a reaction to those white invasions of India. Let's spend a little time with that. The white folks who invaded India were called the Aryans, A-R-Y-A-N-S. And they were drawn to this agricultural society, the wealth of this agricultural society. These people had never used a plow before. They knew nothing about farming. They knew nothing about agriculture. They were nomadic. They were very violent. They were very anti-female. But they were also great warriors. And over a period of about 1,000 years, in what might be called the first race war in history, they were able to defeat the black people, at least in the northern part of India. And they imposed a color segmented social order that has come to be called the caste system. Now the word caste, I think, was introduced by a later group of Europeans, the Portuguese. Um, the whites themselves in ancient India called it Varna, V-A-R-N-A, a word that literally means color. And the social order was broken down into four distinct groups, all racially based. The first group, uh, the group that was on the apex, the pinnacle, the zenith, were called the Aryans. I'm sorry, the Brahmins. Now here's the story. They came, oh, they were from the creator god in Hindu mythology. Are you all following me so far? Yeah. Yeah, am I clear? Sometimes you talk and you know this stuff and you assume everybody knows what you're talking about. So if I'm not being clear, let me know, because otherwise I'm defeating the purpose. It's about communicating with each other. It's talking with one another and trying to get a clear understanding. You know who was the master of that, Malcolm X. That's right. One of the most brilliant orators we've ever had. Malcolm was a master of what we call making it plain. And I would like to think that I've learned a little bit from that school of thought. So if I'm not being clear, say, Renoko, I don't understand what you're talking about. Please do that. Now, white folks come in about 2000 BC. They fight the blacks who had been there for a very long time. They established a color segment of social order that also had a religious base. In fact, Hinduism or the religion called Hinduism is intricately tied up with this. Now, in Hinduism you have a creator God. His name is Brahma. And from Brahma came four beings or four entities and they came from different parts of Brahma's body. From the head or brain of Brahma came the group called the Brahmins. And the Brahmins were identified with the color white. And the Brahmins were the, um, the intellectual aristocracy. They were the intellectuals. They were the poets, uh, or spoken word artists, we would say today. And um, they were the priests. So they had tremendous influence. And beneath them, you have another group called the Kshatriyas. And the Kshatriyas came from the biceps or shoulders of Brahma, and they were identified with the color red. They were the soldiers and the administrators. And then beneath them you have another group called the Vaisha who were identified with the color yellow. And they came from the thighs of Brahma, and they were the farmers and the merchants. And then beneath them you had another group that really represented the masses of conquered black people called the Sudras, S-U-D-R-A-S. They came from the feet of Brahma, according to this story, and they were identified with the color black, and they were basically slaves of all the others. And then there were some hardcore black folk who fought harder than anybody else, but who were ultimately defeated, and those were the outcasts. They were outside of the caste system. 
meaning they were less than human. Today they are called untouchables or dalit, D-L-I-T-S, which means crushed, broken, and oppressed. In a nutshell, that was the ancient racially based social order of India from the time of the Aryan conquest. Now, <clears throat> you have different religions that develop uh, that were represented by the masses of conquered people that came to be very powerful, these religions. The first one we, we could call Jainism. And these are Jain statues. This one, the whole head is missing. This is from Central India. And this one with this really, really nice, happy to be nappy hair, the nose is knocked off there too. That's what I meant. Are the noses to be found missing just in Kemet? Or is it a global phenomenon, and why would that be? Now, I don't know why I keep pushing that button. Now, this is an image of the Buddha itself, or himself. Buddhism, <clears throat> like the Jains, they don't have caste. And women, tell them we said hello, women are very prominent in Buddhism. Everybody turn your cell phone off, please. I need to do that myself, because mine is still on. But I hardly ever get any phone calls. I just get email messages and stuff. Yes, I do spend a lot of time on Facebook. I think of myself, sisters and brothers, I say it unapologetically, as the pharaoh of Facebook, okay? <laughs> and I'm easy to find. You will find me there late tonight after the lecture. Buddhism doesn't believe in caste, neither do the Jains. And another thing about Buddhism, women are relatively liberated in Buddhism. In Hinduism, the woman is nothing. And that is still, for the most part, the case in India today. Okay. Now, this is an, an original photograph of a Buddha in a place called Bodh Gaya, <clears throat> which is where the Buddha is supposed to have sat under the Bodhi tree and received enlightenment. And it's, the statue itself is jet black. When I took the picture, I used the flash, and so it has a kind of a bluish tinge, but it's black. Now, you have different movements of black people into India for different reasons. You have black people as the first people in India, and then you have <clears throat> black people who came and contributed to the classical civilization there. They're called Dravidians. And then you have black people or Africans who are captured and enslaved, just like most of our ancestors, and who are taken to, the, uh, to Southern Asia against their will. Those are called CDs. SI, not like a compact disc CD, but CD, S-I-D-D-I-S. And these uh, sisters and brothers, many of them converted to Islam and, were, and won their freedom as a result of that. And a handful of them became very important. And you are looking at the most important of all the CDs. His name is Malik Ambar. The word Malik means like a king. And this is a brother who was taken from Ethiopia around 1575 or 1600. He's taken to India and he becomes so powerful he has the status of a king. He builds a post office. He, builds, <clears throat> he built a mosque. He was a patron of scholars and historians and poets, uh, and he organized African people throughout Northwest India. This is the great Malik Ambar, and this is an original photograph, too. I think I either took this picture in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts or the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. This is his tomb in India that I did not know about until after I got put out of India. <clears throat> Another CD. And these are CDs in the army. Actually, they are musicians. They are drummers. And these are from a book. The last two or three photographs are from a book that I highly recommend called African Elites in India. African Elites in India that just came out about five years ago. It's excellent. It's almost nothing but photographs. It's superb. And it's written by the people themselves. Another CD merchant. And then this is where I want to spend most of the time, although the focus is on the brutal nature of European behavior <clears throat> or the brutal nature of European oppression, I really want to focus on our people and our reaction to that uh, oppression. So let me spend some time here just showing you pictures, many of which are brand new and have not been shown here before, of black people in India today. And a lot of these people are untouchables or Dalits or outcasts or tribals. Can everybody see? Now, just look at some. Now, these are what I call the invisible people, meaning <clears throat> you're not going to see them on CNN. You're not going to see them on Fox. You're not going to see them on MSNBC. You ain't going to see them on BBC very often. But this is what a sizable population in India look like, and these are the most oppressed of the oppressed. 
The sisters and brothers in India are the most oppressed people on earth. This system of untouchability still exists today in different forms. It is very common for uh, these sisters and brothers who are trying to gain their rights to be uh, given the most brutal uh, forms of punishment. Historically, <clears throat> it was that way also. For example, in ancient times, if an untouchable or outcast, somebody outside the caste system, was taught listening to the reading of a sacred text, their ear would be filled with molten lead or tin. If you struck a member of a higher caste, the caste that I mentioned, that offending limb would be cut off. Your leg would be cut off, chopped off, or your arm would be cut off. If you had sexual intercourse with a woman of a higher caste, you would be castrated. Now, it's not quite like that, but it's still not very good. In uh, more recent times, in more recent times, how do I want to express this? Um, it's modified a little bit. But, for example, you hear stories almost every day, at least I get stories every day, of women who are gang raped, untouchable women or, or tribal women, or a person <clears throat> who was forced to drink human urine or eat human feces for attempting to enter into a temple or go to a school. This is right now. This is in 2010. And I've been among them, and I, I've heard their stories. So you can see the Africoid features among these sisters and brothers. This is a group, excellent one right here. Look at this sister right here. Now, you would think, if you didn't know better, she was from right here in Baltimore. But this is a woman from the Punjab in northwest India. And this even surprised me. Some of these pictures, most of them, in fact, are either, either taken by me or sent to me by untouchables themselves from different parts of the world because they want us to be aware that we have sisters and brothers in India. But you can also still see a degree of defiance. For example, among them, you have groups like the Dalit Panther Party. The Dalit Panthers name themselves after the Black Panther Party. Some of Marcus Garvey's works have been translated among these sisters and brothers. When I went there the first time and I was among them, I saw copies of Roots by Alex Haley translated into languages that they can understand. They have a deep appreciation for the struggle of Africans in the United States. And that's why the government of India has told me if I come over there, that'll be the last journey I take. Look at how defiant this sister is. Also, in these parts of India, the black women have a role and a status that far overshadows their white counterparts. This is one of my oldest pictures. I think I got this photograph around 1980 or so, 30 years ago, when I was a student at UCLA. I would go in the library, I would haunt the libraries at UCLA, go there on Saturday afternoons after I wasn't working because I was on the plantation too. And I would go on a Saturday afternoon and I would spend all day in the library and I would thumb through these old books on India, <clears throat> these anthropological books, and every now and then the pictures would be so old, one or two of the pictures would actually fall out of the book. And I learned from that. I said, well, I'll help a few fall out. And that became the basis of my first library. Now, don't you do that now. Fortunately, <laughs> things are digitized now, because I don't want to set a bad example. Alicia, who used to work in the Library of Congress, looks at me and just, she's appalled. Renoko, how could you do a thing like that? But this brother, I mean, look. Would you think if I didn't tell you that he was from India? This was even better. And the good thing about it was I don't feel any guilt at all because when the books were reprinted, they were reprinted without these photographs. And I didn't have nothing to do with that. Now, this is a new one. All of them are little black children, and they all look different. Now, what she's looking at, I don't know. Maybe she's looking at a European, trying to figure out what that is. And she's got an interesting look on her face, too. And she's just adorable. The tribal people in East India. Now, these are the ones who, when the Europeans came into India, they were treated into the hills and the hinterlands. They were determined to maintain their traditional lifestyles. And in order to do that, to escape from the brutality of European oppression, they went high into the mountains. And they live there today. These folk, for example, are called the wild people. And they're called the wild people because they've just gone and isolated themselves. I can't even visit them. I had a friend of mine who visited them, but he was smarter than me, and he had more time on his hands than me. Now, 
When I tried to go and visit them, I was told that they were so far in the mountains, you needed a special vehicle, and it would take you so much time to get there. He had a week on his hands, and so he waited with another group of sisters and brothers for them to come down from the mountains on market day when they traded their goods. And he said a whole group of them came down. Men and women. He says the brothers were, had uh, machetes, but the sisters were very, very friendly. So he had to walk a very, very fine line between the machetes and the friendly people. And he said he talked to them. And I said, what did you say? He said, I told them that I was an African from the United States, that I was a black American. And I said, well, what did they say? He said, what is America, was their question. But they didn't even know. He told me these sisters and brothers did not even know they lived in India but they lived on the side of this mountain, and that was their reality. Now, she looks very much like she could be from Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea. Very beautiful sister, I might add. <coughs> and these are the victims of European oppression. I better pick up the pace a little bit. But, you know, I just love these pictures so much, I could just watch them all day. This is a student. These are the black people of India who are the victims of European racism. And it's interesting that the system that I laid out about um, the caste system is very, very similar to apartheid South Africa, with the whites on top, the so-called mixed races in the middle, and the masses of black people on the bottom. That's why India is important, because we are told, many of us, going through the academic arena, that racism as we know it today developed as a result of a reaction to the transatlantic slave trade. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but this is what I was taught, that this idea of one group being inferior to another group was uh, put into existence because of the need to justify the European oppression of people of color and black people in particular. But what you find, have, and, are, is anybody familiar with that story, that theory? That's commonly taught, right? But what we find is if we go back 3,500 years ago, we can find an almost identical system in India, long before the transatlantic slave trade. And that's another reason, again, this study is so important. And you can also play along with me the game who that is. Same thing. And how you play, okay, very good. <laughs> how you play who that is, when you see somebody that look like you know them, you're supposed to say who that is. It does look like Samuel L. Jackson in another movie. You know, he's in, he's in costume in the next one. These are all from Northwest India, places where even I don't expect to find sisters and brothers. So they sent me, the, the people who live there sent me these pictures. Now he's from a group called the Oran. And this is one of my favorite photographs right here. Oh yeah, you're no Rashidi. Legend in his own mind. Now he's not a black person from India. These folk are from India. This was my guide. But look at this brother right here. That is some kind of black. Camera almost missed. Yeah, and I stared at that brother for a long, long, long time. He stood out among a group of other people. And I couldn't take my eyes off that brother. And he was, for whatever reason, staring at me too. Now, I don't know what he was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make a homophobic remark or something that could be construed as homophobic. And please don't ask me what I think about Tyler Perry tonight. Yeah. Um, but damn, I had never seen anybody that black before was what I was thinking. And he was looking at me, yeah, don't you, look, don't you wish you look like this? And he was absolutely correct. It never even occurred to me to ask his brother his name. And he's from a group called the Munda, M-U-N-D-A. Here's another group in, now that brother's in Northeast India. This is another group in Southwest India. They're all black people, different phenotypes, some are tall, some are short, et cetera, et cetera. And this, of course, is one of my favorite pictures. Now, she looks just like my mother. The hair, everything. And what stands out here are the earlobes because of the heavy metal objects. That, I guess that's gold. And <clears throat> I don't think she's a tri I don't know what this sister is. I don't know if she's a tribal person or she's a member of a caste. I say that because of the mark on her forehead. A tribal person traditionally wouldn't have that, and neither would an untouchable. So some black people have managed to um, 
work their way into the highest echelons of, the, of this European oppressive caste system. But they're very rare, just like today. It's very rare. This is one of the best. Now just look at that. Now that's, that's impressive, right? You all are a quiet audience. Is it me or is it Friday night? Are you just mesmerized or what? But that's a powerful, powerful photograph to me. One of the best. Does that look like anybody you might know? Yeah. Who? Denver. Who? Oh, Whoopi Goldberg. Now that's a stretch now there, man. I don't see I don't see Whoopi Goldberg in that picture right there. Maybe we better change the rules of the game or something. Again, this original picture, I took that one myself on my last trip to India. My last trip to India, I was followed by the police. And every time I gave a speech or there was a rally, you know, we knew there would be police in the audience. And finally, after the trip was over, they uh, interrogated all the travel agents in India who took me around and, and scared them into uh, hosting me again. This is one of those old black and whites I got out of one of those books at UCLA. Alicia, forgive me, please. Now, she's a CD, a CD child. Again, the CDs are the descendants, the CDs today are the descendants of those Africans who were captured from East Africa, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Kenya, Tanzania, etc., and taken to India within the last 1,400 years or so. And the reason I know it instinctively is because she's got kinky hair. She's got happy to be nappy hair. Whereas the ones who've been there for tens of thousands of years would tend to have naturally straight hair. And those Indians really trip off hair. You know, I'm talking about the black people in India. I used to have hair, you know, a long time ago. And I would go there and they would look at my hair and they would say, oh, wow, you have such beautiful hair. I wish my hair was like yours. And I said, if you came to the United States, you would get the shock of your life. Now, these sisters and brothers, you may be able to tell by this time, are from the north. And the reason, the ones in the north tend to be lighter. And this brother came to be a very good friend of mine. His name is M. Ijaz Ali, and he was very rare. He actually became a surgeon. He was born in Untouchable, and somehow or another, they have an affirmative action system, became a surgeon. And we became really tight on my second trip to India, and he took it upon himself to make sure that I was well taken care of and that I was very safe. One of his functions was to organize my security in India so I didn't have to worry about anything. And one day, we were just sitting there talking. It might have been this day. And he's a Muslim, by the way. And you can see a cap on my head because I tried to adapt. Uh, I think without me asking him, he says, you must wonder why some of us in the North are much lighter than those in the South. I said, well, yeah, it did cross my mind. He says, because of thousands of years of sexually trafficking in our women by the European invaders. But a wonderful brother. This was my number one security man. And this was my number one my number two security man, and this little girl, she just followed me around wherever I went. They had never met an African-American before. And, they would, and he would say, they would ask his brother, well, who is this man? What is he doing here? And he says, he's here working on a book on relationships between the Dalits and African-Americans. And again, they had the same question, what is America? For, for, as far as they were concerned, it could have been another planet. That's how far removed they are. They are so caught up and just trying to survive from day to day, not educated. It's, it's a pretty, pretty tough existence. You may have seen this man, Satya Sai Baba. He's a low caste. He's not an untouchable. He's a low caste. And you could say he's getting over because he's fooling these white folk because they think he's a, an avatar. He's just a magician. He has the ability, for example, of he can be sitting right here and all at once, he'll put his hand under the table and come up with a diamond ring. And he's got white people believing that he materialized that diamond ring. And he just had it under the table. You know, so he's very slick. Oh, Renoko Rashidi again. Legend in his own time. Legend in his own mind, I should say. And here he is in front of the Taj Mahal, which was built for a black woman. This is called Poetry and Marvel. This is built for the wife of the Emperor Shah Jahan one of the Mughal emperors, and he was so grief-stricken at the death of his Ethiopian wife, who I believe died in childbirth, that he built this magnificent 
uh, temple for uh, this magnificent mausoleum for her. And his temple, his mausoleum is black, interestingly enough, and hers is white. This is a brother who somehow was able to worm himself up into the hierarchy. He's actually a Brahmin himself, a black Brahmin, very, very rare. Now, here's something interesting right here, and this comes from the European experience. One of the things you do in India, if you are an untouchable, and if you do something that's considered offensive to a higher caste, you will bow down, you will actually lay down. And the person of the higher caste is supposed to take their foot and put it on your head. That's a sign of obedience. And there was one brother who I really respected, the head of the Carolina Dollar Panthers, who pissed me off one day, and he did that. I couldn't believe it. We were on a busy street, and he just laid down on the sidewalk and says, Renoko, please put your head on my feet. I said, come on, brother, get up. I'm not going to tell you what I actually said, but I made it clear that, come on now. They, most of them are so beaten down that the idea of revolt and rebellion to them is almost foreign. And that is why I shook up the place so much. For example, there was an incident in one place that I went to, a city, and they were saying, well, what would the African Americans do if something like that happened? And I said, we've been known to burn cities down to the ground. So you know I wasn't going to last too long over there because the newspaper people would follow me around, and they would hear me, and they would quote that in the papers and stuff. So I was really lucky to get out of there without uh, getting in more trouble. And I would never go back to India. You know, I'm confident that I will be assassinated if I go back there. Now, this is the result of European oppression and invasion of India. These are the untouchables, and this is the kind of labor that they're forced to engage in. Now, this is a woman. Can you imagine how heavy that must be, the kind of load, the kind of structural damage that that must, you know, have on her neck over a long period? Look at that. I bet none of us could do that. And that is how they are forced to earn their living. Another way they earn their living is they are scavengers, meaning wh by, by which I mean that they take, um, they empty latrines, they empty toilets, they use their hands, pieces of wood to scrape the feces out and put it in a bucket and they carry it on top of their heads and dump it on the outskirts of the city. Some untouchables are considered so impure that even other untouchables won't go near them. And naturally, those are the ones I feel the closest connection to. That's what this sister is, a scavenger. You can see them, you can tell them, because they're usually dirty, they're very unkempt. This is just from a museum. Bangladesh, I'm almost finished with India. Ah, I showed that one again. Now let's move to another area where the brutality of Europeans has been as severe, or almost as severe. If I was going to name the three most racist places in the world for black people, India tops the list, number one by far. India is the most color-conscious society on earth. They, the words like fair skin is very, very big. Skin bleaching is very big there. The idea of being fair skin is considered very, very desirable. But the next place on the list would have to be Australia because our people have been treated like two-footed beasts in both of those places. Australia, and again, here's Australia, and here's Tasmania, was established as a British prison settlement, uh, one after the other, beginning in 1788. The first one was New South Wales, and the second one would have either been South Australia or Queensland. Eventually, they would take Victoria, and where my brother just came from, and uh, Tasmania. And Tasmania is where the worst of the British were brought to. These were convicts who were taken from British uh, prisons and brought to Australia and Tasmania to settle it for the crown. And they never recognized that there were human beings in these places. The white people who came here regarded the blacks as plants and animals, as flora and fauna. It was not a crime to kill a black person. In fact, there was a famous case in the 19... It may have even been the 1960s where a brother was killed by a European and he got off because his father, the culprit, had given him a license to hunt black people. And he produced that, it's a true story, he produced that document in court and he was acquitted of killing this black person. Now until 1967, black people in Australia were not considered humans by the government. 
In January 1967, there was a national referendum that decided that the Aboriginal Australians would be regarded as human beings and citizens in Australia for the first time in history, meaning they could be a part of a labor union, they could be admitted to a hospital, perhaps they could even go to a college or university. Today, the average life expectancy of a black person in Australia is 37 years. A black man in Australia, his average life expectancy is 37 years. Black people make up, in this area where the masses of black people are, make up 3% of the total population and yet 80% of the prison population. It's the injustice system that parallels what we know here. Oh, there's your tour guide, Renoko in the center of Australia. And these are early depictions of Aboriginal leaders who fought the Europeans. The greatest Aboriginal resistance leader was a man named Pimulwe, P-E-M-U-L-Y. P-E-M-U-L-W-Y. And interestingly enough, he was not killed by a European. He was killed by a black man from Africa who was a part of the British invasion of India beginning in January 1788. So these are early resistance leaders, and here you can see they're going into battle. They were very brave warriors, but it's very hard to stand up with a wooden shield and a, um, a javelin when you have heavy duty artillery that you're fighting against. So the whites came, they took the land, they, they hunted these brothers and sisters down, they poisoned them, they scalped them, they skinned them, they decapitated them, they castrated them. One of the things, and this was told to me by Aboriginal Australians that Europeans used to do for sport, was to take a black family, an Aboriginal family, and just gather them together, a let's say a husband, a wife, and a child. And first you would dispose of the husband. While the wife and the child is watching, you would take this brother and handcuff him and then castrate him, cut his genital organs off. And this is not for the faint-hearted now. And he would bleed to death and die. And then he would be, his head would be cut off and the head would be uh, attached with a rope around his widow's neck. And then she would be gang raped. The children are watching this. And then they would take the children and bury them up to their necks in the sand and take bats or clubs and knock their heads off the babies. And the mother's forced to watch that. That's just what aboriginals told me. This may not be in the books, but that is a, what do you say about that? This is the person that we're dealing with today. That we still haven't figured that out yet. And this is not about hating white folks. But this is about examining the personality, the cultural personality of these Europeans. All right. Now up here, a lot of these sisters and brothers are buried. And they put their bodies up here, the Aboriginal Australians, they put the bodies of sisters and brothers up there to keep them away from the Europeans. By 1860, there was a thriving trade in Aboriginal people's body parts. You know, a black man's penis, for example, would be dried out and used as a tobacco pouch or um, they would be skinned, and the, uh, the, the dried skin of the Aboriginal person would be taken to Europe and just hung on a wall. I'll talk about that a bit more later. This is in the north. This is an original photograph. Australia's a beautiful place. The name means Great South Land, and you can see some of the people here who survived that particular Holocaust. Let me go through these quickly. Now, this brother is from Tasmania. Now, the difference between Tasmania and mainland Australia is that the killers from England, the British prisons, were taken to Tasmania. It was an island. So it was thought that it would be uh, the best place for these people. And they got loose against the Aboriginal Australians in Tasmania. And they just slaughtered them systematically. So by 1876, this was the last one, and this is her as a young woman. Her name is Truganini. These pictures come from the museum in Hobart, Tasmania, and she was the last full blood. Now, for years, I wrote that she was the last one, but she wasn't. She was the last full blood. I actually went to Tasmania, and I met the descendants of these sisters and brothers, and what happened was um, they weren't all wiped out but that these white seal hunters captured Aboriginal women and used them as sexual slaves. And children were born from those unions. So you have, uh, the British would say, 
half-caste, or mixed-race Aboriginal Australians who are not accepted by the full bloods and they're certainly not accepted by uh, the whites. So they have a very schizophrenic type of marginal existence. And they just, just, it's just heartbreaking to be around them and to hear their stories, to hear about how their children were taken away and uh, raised as slaves. So these are from Tasmania. Now this is the same sister as a mature woman. She's the last full-blood Tasmanian. She died in 1876. Her name is Truganini. And in spite of that, Tasmania is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Let's look at some of the images of Tasmania. I mean, breathtakingly beautiful. Look at that. I call it the ghost land because it seemed to me when I was there, I would be in a forested area and it just seemed to me that I would see them look, the Aboriginal Tasmania, I would see them looking at me from behind a tree or behind a rock. It is a very eerie, eerie feeling. Now, Aboriginal Australians, I think, believe that too because they believe, at least they told me, that if you are not properly buried, your spirit will continue to wander. And so if, sometimes I would see something that looked like a, a tree or rock that looked like a human being to me. And I would point that out to an Aboriginal sister or brother that I was in. So, oh, yeah, it's one of our ancestors. They were not properly buried. There's one brother that I met. His whole function was to go to Europe and get the body parts of his ancestors and bring them back to Australia for proper burial. All these are Tasmania, and there is such a thing as a Tasmanian devil. In fact, there's two types of Tasmanian devils. One on two feet with pale skin, and one is a four-footed beast. And I don't know which one is the most vicious. And this is uh, Truganini again. This is a whole group of them, the last of them, herded together. You can see it's very cold there, too. Uh, herded together in a concentration camp at a place called Oyster Cove. I went there, and that's why I felt like I could just feel the spirit of them around me. Now, Aboriginal Australians are very interesting in that they have a close connection to the earth. They call the earth mother. And, what, and I saw them whenever possible. They sit on the ground, they lay on the ground, they sleep on the ground, they go barefooted. They're very closely connected to the earth. And they are the most spiritual people that I've ever encountered. And you can see they look absolutely miserable. This is the last male right here. His name was William Laney. This is Truganini. They all got venereal diseases. William Laney died when he was only about 34 years old. He was the last male. He died in 1869. And this is a picture I took in Tasmania at Oyster Cove, the former concentration camp. It says, our, fu our future generation will save our nation. And in the middle, it has black history. And these are the national colors of Aboriginal people, black for the people, gold for the sun, and red for the land because they say the land is covered with their blood. Now, if you want to see European brutality at its worst, Australia and India are the two places. And these are just the people there. Their eyes tell the story of the near destruction of their people. Uh, they have real problems today with substance abuse, domestic violence, because they are, I guess that's a result of victimization. They're only a small percentage of the population, so it's not like they're going to have a black prime minister of Australia. These are the two of the founding members of the Aboriginal Australian Black Panther Party. And I like to show this picture to show that I'm, even though it doesn't look like it, I'm trying to be health conscious. Mm -hmm. This sister is on a place called Palm Island. And when I met her, she didn't know how old she was. That they have been so, their lives have been so carefully controlled and regulated by Europeans that some of the older ones can't even tell you how old they are when they were born. And yet there's a spirit of resistance. This sister right here is Graceland Smallwood, one of my very good friends. And this brother right here is the brother, was the mayor of an, an Aboriginal um, community. She looks so much like Venus Williams. You find a prevalence of blonde hair in the center and the south. She's from the state of Queensland. The Aboriginal Australians call Queensland KKK country. 
the original photograph on Palm Island where the whites put the most rebellious of the black people in Australia, or at least in that part, and this is where their descendants survived. Now this is Humelo Biko and this is Samoa Biko. These are the two youngest sons of Stephen Biko. And this is myself and this is a mixed Aboriginal Australian Tory Strait Islander. Um, you know there are some very uh, serious sisters and brothers over there now and they invited the Biko brothers and myself to come to Australia and address them in 1998. Instead of just talking about how vicious Europeans have been towards us for the most part I tried to show images of black people in these parts of the world so that it wasn't so completely one-sided. But it, it didn't occur, and what I wanted to talk about, or what I did talk about, was black-white relations for the most part. I didn't talk about our relationship with other Asians. And what I really didn't talk about, and I want to mention it just briefly, is how Europeans have treated one another. For example, in May, I went to Poland and I also naturally took advantage of the opportunity to visit the National Archaeology Museum in Warsaw or the Archaeological Museum. But I made it a point to stay in Poland I think four days, which is a long time. As uh, Muda Baruka said, it's not good to stay in a white man's country too long. And Poland is really a white man's country. It's like 99.9% .9 European. You don't hardly see any Asians. You just don't. And you hardly know black people. But I also went to Auschwitz. I went to the concentration. I wanted to go. As an African historian, I wanted to have that experience. I wanted to compare it uh, to some of the dungeons and what have you. So I went to Auschwitz. Uh, there it's in a community called Owisum. And the actual uh, death camp was called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau too, because that's where most of the killings took place, most of the exterminations. I have great sympathy unlike some folk, for what happened to those people. And I went to Owesome, I took a bus, and I was just amazed at what I saw. It's like Disneyland. It's like a carnival. It's all about making money. And they charge people exorbitant fees to go into concentration camp to see where the people were exterminated, to see the criminal. I couldn't, even, I couldn't stand it. I got on the bus and left. I would not have thought Jewish people would have allowed their history yeah. and their culture to be commercialized that way. People were eating hot dogs and smoking cigarettes and playing loud music and laughing and joking. And this is from Auschwitz. This is where this was the major death camp or the extermination center for the Nazis. And you know, some of these concentration camps, there were black people themselves, particularly in Dachau. But anyway, I just wanted to show you a few more pictures. And, in, and this, of course, makes me uh, think about how Europeans have treated each other. It's so a brother who was somehow ended up in Spain and he was stuffed by a taxidermist and his body was put on display and some people think the body parts are still in Europe right now. Around the beginning of the last century it was very common to put uh, what Europeans regarded as inferior people on display. Um, even some white people were treated like that. For example, there's a famous story um, of the Elephant Man. You may remember that Oscar-winning film, a man named John Merrick who had all kinds of physical deformities and he was put on display. Well, Europeans had a thing about that during the time of Victorian England. And they would put people they regarded as inferior on display. So this brother, this San man, was put on display and that's what he looked like. That brother I showed you was actually a San brother that I met in Namibia, Southern Africa, a few years ago. So after uh, his body had been in, in a Spanish museum for almost 100 years, and this information was brought to light during the Olympic Games that was held in Spain some years ago. The African athletes were making a fuss about this brother whose body was still on display in a Spanish museum. Mm. So they raised so much hell, there was so much pressure brought to bear on the Spanish that they took the body off display and supposedly they shipped it back to South Africa. Now I was uh, in Southern Africa at least. I was just uh, in Spain a couple of months ago and I was talking to some sisters and brothers and they believe the body is still there. But this is the official burial site. He was taken um, supposedly from the museum in Spain to Botswana. 
and they call him El Negro or the Negro because they don't know his name. And this is where he was buried in um, Botswana. So I wanted to show you that. And let me see. I wanted to show you some other pictures. Ah, this is a good one. This one, this is Fort Jesus. This, there actually is a dungeon called Fort Jesus. It's in Mombasa, Kenya. And it was a dungeon where enslaved Africans were kept by the Portuguese. This is El Negro's grave. This sister is from a group called the Herero. And you, there's two groups, uh, two big groups in Namibia, the country that used to be called Southwest Africa, the Herero and the Ovambo. And the Herero revolted against the, um, the Germans. The Germans, the Dutch, and the Belgians were the worst. They were by far the most brutal of the enslavers and colonizers. And the, um, the Germans tried to exterminate these people. Even if they tried to surrender, they would not accept their surrender. They would exterminate them or drive them into the desert. And these sisters and brothers have the best case for reparations. I think the Germans are going to be forced to pay these people some money. It is. You know, now the first time I went, my body would not allow me to go down inside the dungeon. It was like there was an invisible barrier that was in front that wouldn't let me go down. It took a long time for me to go, be able to force myself to go in the dungeons. And the first dungeon I went into was the women's dungeon. And there's a space, there's two big dungeons in Ghana. There's Elmina and there's Cape Coast. And they're both horrible. I think Cape Coast is probably the worst. And there's a place there, first of all, the way the women were treated. One place, you have a, a bunch of cannonballs, these big heavy cannonballs, and women who refused to be raped would be chained to those cannonballs out in the noonday sun. And they would keep them there until their spirit would break, okay, for many of them. And others, there was a special room made of stone, and they would keep these sisters in there until they died. There was just a little slit for food, because they didn't want them to starve. They wanted them to, the, uh, the uh, Europeans wanted them to live so that they could be an example to the other women. If you refused to be raped, they would put you in there until eventually you would just wither away and die. And here I am with this young sister in front of one of those dungeons, the entrance to one of those dungeons in Ghana. And in every one of those places, there was, you had a special dungeon, but you also had, I thought this was a picture of a church, because each one of the uh, big um, dungeons on the west coast of Africa, there's a church in, in every one. Okay. This one is from Nigeria, and this just shows the capture of the city, of the great city of Benin, and the plunder that the British were able to take from Nigeria. Most of these artifacts are still in European museums now. Auschwitz showed that, showed the sign, brother. This is what they look like. They're called Bushmen in the pejorative word. And years ago, I would have said they have Asian features. Now, I would say a lot of Asians look like these sisters and brothers. Oh, I keep coming back to that. There's still a couple that I'm missing. And I want to show you them. Because there's one that to me beggars the imagination. Oh my God, what happened? Ah, here it is. I'm going to show you two more. And then we can have a question and answer period. Maybe three more. This is Gory Island in Senegal, and this is called Slave Island. Now, there were apparently many of these uh, places, but there were some that were really big. There was about six of them where the Africans were kept. Gory Island is one in Senegal. I already mentioned the two in Ghana, Cape Coast and Elmina. In Benin, you have another big one, a fortress called Wida. And then you have the three in Nigeria. The one I couldn't think of is called Badagari that I haven't been to yet. And then there are two more. There's one in a place called Calabar, and there's one called Boney. This is um, one of the dungeons. I think there's three dungeons on uh, Gory Island. But they have an infant. They had, a, they had an infant's dungeon. Now, that's maybe the deepest part of all. They had a dungeon for the men and the dungeon for the women. That was always the case. They would separate the men from the women, and the women would be raped. And everybody would be branded with a hot iron. I think I showed you in the earlier section of somebody brand, you know, branding an African with a hot iron like an animal, like a, a cow. Gory Island also had a dungeon for skinny people. I know I would not have been in that one. And they would keep you in there until and fatten you up. 
because you would be more profitable if they sold you. But they had a dungeon for babies. Now, I would not have believed that if I hadn't been there and gone inside it and taken a picture. If you had told me that, I would have said, no, that's not possible. No people could be that cruel. But they had a dungeon for infants. Now, I want you to think on that for a moment. And this is the last. Maybe I'll show you one more picture. But I want you to think on that. Imagine you're in the men's dungeon. And your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter is in the women's dungeon. And you are helpless to do anything about that. Okay? Maybe you can hear her screaming. And we could perhaps hear those screams even now if we listened. But then your child, your little sister, your little brother, your baby, is in the infant's dungeon. And that child is calling your name. And you are unable to answer those pleas. And so the psychological damage that results from the brutal nature of European behavior is with us today. I know we don't want to talk about that. It's shameful, it's embarrassing, it's humiliating. But somehow, at some point, we got to come to grips with that. Because we can't heal until we, we deal with it, until we put it on the table. How does that affect my relationship with my woman, knowing there was a time when I could not protect her? How do my children look at me when they know there was a time when I was helpless? I mean, isn't that also about, we talk about the feminization of the black male or the emasculation of the black male. So the residual effects of that, I would argue, still haunt us today. And it affects our relationships and how we interact with each other. I think there's maybe one more that I want to show. And I know this hasn't been a, a pleasant, a fun presentation, but it's important. I just want to show you one more if I can find it. Oh my God. I wanted to show you a picture, and you can see I, I carry around with me about 10,000 photographs wherever I go. But I wanted to see, and it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to find it, a photograph of a, a coy woman because there was a sister in history about 200 years ago named Sarchi Bartman. Sometimes she's called simply Sarah Bartman. And this is a black woman who was uh, from Southern Africa, and she is from the group called the Koi or the Nama. And she was talked into, um, here it is. This isn't Sarchi Bartman, but it's similar. She was talked into going to Europe and putting her body on display. And she was basically turned into a circus freak. And uh, when she died when she was about 28, I think she had syphilis, maybe died of complications of that. And she was raped and humiliated. She had this big behind, these big hips, and Europeans just made fun of her. They poked her with sticks. And when she died, her brain was cut out and her um, genital organs were removed. And they were kept in a jar of alcohol in the, um, the Natural History Museum in Paris for a very long time. And it wasn't until the advent of Nelson Mandela, who when uh, South Africa apartheid so-called ended and he became president of South Africa, he intervened on, the, on behalf of the South African government with the French and they got Sarah Bart, Sarge Bartman's body parts back and buried them in South Africa. And there was a huge ceremony. And I talked to, San, I talked to Koi people and Namas in South Africa and they told me how emotional it was for them how grown men broke down and cried like babies when those body parts were taken back. That's the nature of the person that we're dealing with. And I don't think we figured out how to interact with these people even now. The brutality of Europeans even now staggers the imagination. And we still have the Amadou B uh, Diallos and the Rodney Kings and the Abner Louimas. And every time one of these, and the, uh, the guy who shot the brother, the young brother in Oakland, or the white boy who was given a six months jail sentence for murdering a brother during the civil rights era in Alabama. And yet Michael Vick got nine, did 19 months in prison for a dog ring. And I think every time one of these things happen, it shocks us, we're appalled because we somehow are not able to grasp and come to grips with the mentality of these Europeans. Even now, I mean, how can people do those kinds of things? And I guess until we figure that out, we just not going to be able to take our rightful place under the sun. So that's the presentation that I wanted to share with you tonight. I didn't enjoy it, you know, and I don't think you would have enjoyed it. But it's also a part of what we have to talk about. We have to talk about everything. 
And a part of what we have to talk about is the brutal nature of European behavior and how we're going to deal with that. So now let's open it up for some questions and answers and comments and, and see where we go. And I want to thank our hosts and hostesses for organizing this program. Next time I come, I'll talk about something nice. I'll show pyramids and stuff like that. Okay? Again and again and again and again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give another big round of applause for the Mr. Ortiz. Thank you. I'm going to make a statement, and uh, I'd just like you to address it, please. Okay. Um, my, my personal feeling and philosophy is that I think we're still making the same mistake that we made hundreds of years ago by hoping and praying that one day we might be able to work it out with these people. And I, I think that's probably the biggest mistake that we'll ever make, and until we get that straight, I don't think anything else will, you know, materialize for us. Well, I'm not going to argue with you, folks. Okay. <laughs> you make a good point. Next. Uh, greetings to you. Greetings. Uh, uh, welcome to Baltimore. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your wisdom and the history that you bring into us. Uh, as I said, also greetings to my cousin Andre. Oh, good California. Good brother. <laughs> yeah. um, my question is, when you first spoke about things, you told us about the history of us all being of the human race. Well, can you explain to me what brings the distinction that there's been such a change that as mm -hmm. we migrated to all parts of the world, all from one single beginning or originality, orientation or beginning, to that the, the white man has been so vile and evil and brutal in his treatment of his brothers that are of the same seed? I think it's called adaptation. You could get, now, some of it we have to use, I'll try to use what I would call a common sense uh, example of that. Let's suppose, for example, heaven forbid, that one of us will go to prison. You're going to have to adapt. You're going to deal, you're going to be in a cold, harsh environment. And you're going to have to toughen up if you're going to survive that experience. Well, imagine being in an ice box for 20,000 years and the kind of mentality that will come as a result of that. Or no food. I mean, sometimes I, I just heard so many stories about how sometimes people would be so hungry that a baby would be born and they would eat the baby. You're living in a cave. There's no, there's no comfort around you. There's no food. You can't, the ground is so cold you can't even bury the dead. So it's no wonder you would develop a mentality that the, only the toughest could survive. The survival of the fittest might makes right. It's a matter of adaptation. And we all adapt to our environment. You might say you have to adapt living in Baltimore. If you come from Hokoboka, you know, Tennessee or something like that, small town of 5,000, and you come to an urban environment, you have to adapt to that. So we are talking about a very, very extreme form of adaptation. But there's no doubt in my mind as one race, and that's the human race, which has African roots. But even the African people of today have had to adapt to various environments. That's, that's what I think. It's just a matter of adaptation. The books I would refer you to are um, A Culture Unity of Black Africa by Sheikh Anta Jouk, and also the book uh, The Iceman Inheritance by Michael Bradley. And they talk about the consequences of living in that ice for 20,000 years. And it developed, it produced a very very harsh, shall we say, personality. That's what I think. Thank you, brother. Hello, brother. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, it's nice I to think see you again. It's nice to see you again, always. I'm always, um, you know, this particular lecture was extremely necessary. I know you said you couldn't make your jokes and things, but, you know, I probably need you a lot of that anyway, so we don't really need that tonight anyway. But, um, I don't think black people, I mean, in fact, I know we can't fathom their evil. We, you know, it, it's just not, you know, we can't fathom it. We stop and we just... But here's the thing. They don't see it as evil. Yeah, they don't. For them, it's perfectly normal behavior. When you're talking about the adaptation thing and all, yeah. it's, you know, the sun has tempered us to make us, you know, we're kind people because of the sun, you know, the color, 
we the human beings, you know. Dr. Africa said there's some kind of human, I mean, there's some kind of mankind, but not human, you know. So I saw that thing. They, we come from the same sea, probably, but it's long, you know, whatever. What I wanted to ask you, though, is the fact that in the beginning you were saying that um, Africans, basically, when we went around the world, we gave gifts to people. Um, I usually have this conversation with a lot of people because, you know, they're saying, no, you know, we did the same thing that the whites did. Can you tell me of any group of Africans who left that continent and, you know, were extremely aggressive? You know, I know some cases there, some small cases, but maybe, I don't know of any, but I'm told that they are. And then I had a discussion with someone today saying, well, your own people, of course, orchestrated a lot of the slave trade. But my thing is that they didn't have any idea of what type of slavery that, you know, was existed in the Americas. Uh, slavery has always existed ever since time against the evil institution. But they didn't have any idea of what type of slavery they were getting their people into. So could you sort of talk about that a little bit? Okay, now the first thing you want me to talk about I find very interesting. I am not able to find a single example, and if anybody would know, I think I would be the person, not bragging, but I can't find a single example of Africans who left Africa and in, in ancient times and engaged in destructive acts. You know, we could find one example after the other of Africans and women, like the Moors in Spain. The Moors, under the Moors in Spain, religious tolerance was the norm. It wasn't like that among the white Spanish Christians who were very fanatical and intolerant. You have Africans like the Carthaginians under Hannibal who went into Italy. They didn't engage in mass rape and extermination. There's nothing like that. Africans who went, those Africans who went into India, those Africans who sailed to America before Columbus, there's no record of that. And as a result of that, they were treated more or less like deities. Those big Olmec heads, I think, reflect that. So, no, I can't find any examples. And I would ask the audience, can anybody find an example? Tell me of Africans who went somewhere in ancient times and, and messed up, who destroyed and robbed and raped and made people change their names. Anybody tell me an example? There are none. But we can tell you one example after the other of Europeans. That was normal. Do you know the terrible things? We didn't even get to talk about this. That Columbus did. Yes. Columbus almost single-handedly began the transatlantic slave trade. I have been in the place in Spain where Columbus sat down and talked with Isabella about enslavement and the slave trade and what they would do and the money they could make from that. Columbus would take Native American women on his ships and give them to the men on his ships. He would take Native Americans and use them to sharpen the, uh, the, this, the blade on their swords in the flesh of Native Americans. So Columbus was a monster. If he were alive today, we would try him for crimes against humanity. And yet, he's a hero to Italian Americans and many other people. So no, I can't find a single example of Africans who have engaged in those kinds of destructive acts. Now, the second part of your question was, you were asking me to address no, but you have a second part. The part about that we to, to, uh, you know, take our brothers Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's an important question. And I think it's a very sensitive one, and a lot of us are in denial about that. But no, no doubt in my, in, in my mind, and maybe I won't ever get invited back here again, that some Africans actively participated in enslavement. There's no doubt about that. I'll give you an example. Uh, I went to Benin once. I think it was my... May, I don't know if it was my first or second trip to Benin, and there's a place in Benin, I can't recall the name of it, um, but it's a little coastal community, basically built on stilts, and Africans went there to escape the slave hunters. So I took my group there. You know, I do take tours, get one of the flyers, please, maybe you'll travel with me, it would be an honor. And we went, I took a group of about 15 people, and we went to this black community in, on the coast of Benin, and it was very formal, where I couldn't talk directly to the, um, uh, the leading figure there, the, the king or whatever the case may be. I had to talk to an interpreter. And so they asked us formally, what are you doing here? Why, are you, why have you come here? And it just formality. They knew why we were there. We wanted to see the place. And so I started to give this long spiel about, we are the descendants of the Africans who were taken away. He said, stop. He says, I know why you're here, because that's why we're here. Because we came here to escape from the kingdom of Dahomey. I can tell you for a fact that the Dahomey kingdom, the Yoruba kingdom, the kingdom of Asante were active slave catchers. Active slave catchers. 
Now you can say they didn't know what was going to happen. If you can argue that, and they probably didn't. But they certainly engaged in enslavement. There's no doubt about that. And we need to come to grips with that. In fact, the government of Benin has apologized to Africans in the diaspora for their involvement in enslavement. The Yoruba, I just left Nigeria. They tell you the same thing. It's, it's right there. But I think that it's such a sensitive thing to think that your answer, some people in Africa sold you or participated in the capture in the enslavement process. A lot of us are not prepared to admit that. And we want to say that the white man made us do it, and we didn't know what was going on, and we didn't know what was going to happen. I don't know about that. But certainly there were Africans who were involved in it, and anybody who says that they were not is just kidding themselves, because the Africans themselves will tell you that. And we need to grow up and face that. Now, some people don't want to deal with that because they say that'll harm our case for reparations. But I mean, that's just a historical fact, and there ain't no point in running from it. Oh, At the that same that. time, I don't, it, it's, it's dangerous to blame the victim for their victimization. That's right. Because there were Jews involved in the Holocaust. Exactly. Jews that were in, in uh, Poland, they were what were called Jewish councils. And they were responsible for rounding up the people that were put on those trains that took them to Auschwitz. And the Germans made it very clear, either you get a certain amount of people or you'll be on one of those trains. But nobody blames the Jews for the Holocaust. But when it comes to the transatlantic slave trade, there are some people, including some of us, who are quick to say those Africans did it. I'll give you a very quick little story, very interesting story. I've been to, uh, I think, 28 countries in Africa now. I figure I'm good for maybe 40 countries in Africa. And there's only 54, so that's not too bad. And one of the places I went to, one of the most interesting places, was Ethiopia. And I did a series of lectures there, and I did a, a lecture at the University of Bahadur. And Bahadur is right at the beginning of the Blue Nile in Lake Tana. And I gave a, an address to the history department there. And the people were, some of the, they were completely uninterested. I gave what I thought was a brilliant presentation, a brilliant <laughs> expo. And when it was over, I said, who has a question? And nobody said anything. And I said, and I'm talking about the history of Ethiopia. So I said, you mean to tell me I'm going to travel all these thousands of miles and nobody has a question for Anoka Rashidi? And nobody said a word. I said, I'm not going to let you get away with that. I said, if you don't have any questions for me, I got questions for you. They said, OK. And I said, um, when I give presentations among African Americans, I quite often say, um, I ask them, I said, what do you think of when, and I'm not talking about a reality speaks lecture, because y'all are sophisticated. But when the average brother and sister in the hood, I say, what do you think of when you think of Africa? Now, just give it to me gut. Don't dwell on it. Don't get all analytical. What do you think of when you think of people say, I think of wild animals. People say, I think of poverty. People say, I think of disease. And I told those Ethiopians that, and they were pretty mad. They were the saying, thing. You, mean to think, you mean to tell us that's what you all think about us? And I said, well, all too many of them do. So they got really into me. So I said, now here's what I want you to do. And I had a bunch of sisters and brothers with me because it was a tour group. And I said, tell me what you think when you think of African Americans. Everybody's hand went up all at once. Everybody had something to say. But their answer was really, it really surprised. They said, we, when we think of African Americans, we think of, of, of black people who were captured and enslaved and were taken to America and fought and won their freedom. And we want to know why you turn your back on Africa. Oh, the whole room lit up. So I said, turn around and talk to the sisters and brothers in my group and, that, and ask them those questions. And um, three answers came. Two that comes, comes to mind. He said, first of all, a lot of y'all think that because we're in Africa, we're rich. You know, we're not rich. Some of us gave up our life savings to travel to Africa. That was one answer. The next answer was, if we do something for you, if we give you money, you know, how are you going to use that to liberate Africa? That was valid. But the third question really, he says, I, one person says, I'm not going to give you anything because your ancestors sold my ancestors, ancestors into slavery. I think that is a deeply held belief among sisters and brothers in the United States, that I don't owe Africa a damn thing because it's those Africans' fault that I'm over here in the first place because you guys sold us. Whether that's true or not, it is a commonly held belief among many African Americans, it is deep in our psyches. And that's why I spend time on Facebook. That's why I facilitate 
conversation and interaction so that we can talk to one another and work this stuff out, some of which is nonsense and exaggerated. So that's how I would respond to that. Okay. You can see I got very animated. <laughs> My brother, you've been standing there for a long time. I'm happy to stand here. Strong black. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. My pleasure. Uh, I came all the way from D.C. to uh, come and see you. Uh, so I think I saw you about four or five uh, 